All right, so we are starting a new book tonight. Turn with me if you would to 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, we finished 1 Peter uh, before I left for Israel, and now we are going to uh, uh, start going through 2 Peter. So this epistle, um, 2 Peter, this is the last book that Peter wrote. Um, it was written very close to the time of his death. He will mention that as we get further on into the book. Um, Peter is an older man at this time, um, and um, he is about to be martyred for his faith. So we know that Peter was crucified um, for his faith in Jesus, uh, but he requested to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy uh, to be killed in the same manner as Jesus. And so we do know that his life did end. But the theme of this chapter is to know Jesus and grow. So know Jesus and grow. It's such a powerful chapter. I love this chapter. We're only going to do half of it tonight because there's so much in the first half. Um, but yeah, let's just jump in. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And so he introduces himself there. We, uh, we know we've kind of already talked about these terms, but bond servant basically is a slave by choice. So it's where you chose to commit yourself to be a slave to that particular master for the rest of your life. That's how Peter identified himself was as a slave for Jesus by choice. And then he says, and apostle. Apostle just means one that was sent out. Um, definitely Peter was an apostle, obviously, um, you know, spent three and a half years with Jesus being trained by him. Um, he was the leader in the early church in Jerusalem. Um, and so um, here is his kind of final words. And whenever you're talking about somebody's like last words or last thing they're writing, right, they're going to tell you what's most important to them, right? And so this is Peter basically kind of giving his last encouragement to the churches before he dies and so it is very important and very near and dear to his heart what he's going to share with the believers and he goes on there in verse 1 he says to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our god and savior jesus christ so to those who have obtained like precious faith who's that that's us right we have received precious faith we believe that jesus is the christ the son of the living god right like peter had declared and we have also received this precious faith, as Peter refers to it here, and faith in Jesus. And so <clears throat> it's interesting here because he says, um, we've received this precious faith by righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've talked about this a lot, but our righteousness, right, is as filthy rags, the Bible says. But our righteousness, once we put our faith in Jesus, it's his righteousness that he imputes to us. So he gives us his righteousness. He clothes us in his righteousness, which is an amazing thing. And so he, Peter is reminding us that by putting our faith in Jesus, he's given us his righteousness. And now righteousness simply means what? Right with God, right? That we are right with God through Jesus Christ. And he says, Jesus Christ, our God and savior. So for those people who deny that Jesus was God and that he was just a prophet, Peter says it. Thomas said it. If you remember when, when Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room, what did Thomas say? He said, my God and my Lord. So the disciples clearly understood. Jesus claimed to be God many, many times in very clear ways, but also the disciples recognized that Jesus was fully God and fully man, that he was God in the flesh. It goes on. It says in verse number two, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, of God and of Jesus, our Lord. So grace and peace be multiplied to you. Anybody need grace and peace multiplied in your life, right? We talked about this in 1 Peter. We all need grace and peace multiplied to us. But here, Peter tells us how that happens. By the knowledge of God and of Jesus, right? So how do you get grace and peace multiplied in your life? By knowing Jesus, right? By knowing him. And so it, it, as you go on in verse three, he says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. There's that word again, knowledge, right? This is an amazing scripture. It says, as his divine power has given to us, has given to us, so that's a past tense, right? We have it, has given to us all things, all means all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus. Let me repeat that again. The Lord has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of Jesus. And for us, as we look at that, that's such an amazing promise. And that word know there, our knowledge is not a know about, 
Okay, so it's not that you know about Jesus. The knowledge that he's talking about there is a firsthand, personal experience, intimate knowing of somebody, right? Like I, I know who, you know, the president is, but I don't know the president. There's a big difference, right? Between knowing who he is, but actually knowing him. Well, it's the same thing here. When he's talking about the knowledge of Jesus, he's not talking about not knowing who he is. Yeah, you may know who Jesus is, you know, as far as a historical figure or this and that. He's talking about having a personal, individual, experiential relationship with Jesus Christ. And so for us, really, that's the goal of our life, right? After we become a Christian, really our life's pursuit should be getting to know Jesus more and more every day. Developing a closer relationship with Jesus. And so when he's talking about knowing him, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And all those things are found in Jesus. All things. Okay. So what do you need to know as far as life is concerned, right? You need to know how to raise kids. You need to know how to stay married. You need to know what to do about your finances, right? You need to know what job to take. You need to know all, do all those things fit into all things? Yes. And Jesus says, I've already given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And for us, how? How is it that Jesus has given us all these things, the knowledge how to do all of these things? Two things, his word and the Holy Spirit. That is how Jesus gives you all things or has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. One is his word and two is his Holy Spirit. Because the reality of it is through the power of his word and through the power of his Holy Spirit, he has given us everything we need to know to raise kids, to be married, to handle our finances, to figure out our jobs, all of those things. Because there's so much that the Bible lays out very clearly, right? It's black and white, easy to read. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands. That is not Chinese. That is in very plain English. If we did it, we will stay married. That's the truth, but we don't do it, right? I mean, that's where the rub comes, right? It's not a matter of understanding what the Bible says about marriage. It's a matter of doing it, right? The, the Bible says, train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it, right? That's parenting advice for us. That we're to be raising up, instilling in our children the word of God, right? That we're to be talking about it when we sit in the house, when we walk by the way, you know, as we instill that word of God in our kids, right? We're to discipline our kids, just like God disciplined us. So all of these things that the Bible says, your finances, the Bible is very clear. You put God first in your finances and he will bless your finances, period, end of story. You know, and he says like, we put money with a bag with holes in it because we do not honor God with our possessions. So there's lots and lots of practical, I mean, I could go on all night, right? About practical living advice that the Bible gives. But then there's that in between stuff, right? There's like, okay, but I got this kid and he's got this issue, right? What do I do about this one? Cause I got four kids, three teenage boys, well now young adult boys, and they're all so different, right? And I have to deal with them in very different ways. What works for one doesn't work for the other. So how do I know what to do with each individual kid? The Holy Spirit. That's where the Holy Spirit comes into play. How do I know if I have this job and this job, right? Two paths in front of me. How do I know which job I'm supposed to take? It doesn't say in the Bible, Lydia, you should take a job at Grand Canyon University, right? <laughs> However, the Bible does say, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all of your ways, acknowledge me and I will direct your paths. So as I begin to do what the Bible instructs me to do, I begin to seek the Lord and trust in him. And as he leads me by the power of his Holy Spirit, where he gives me a peace, he gives me an anxiety, he leads me in the right way, he opens doors, he shuts doors. That's how the Holy Spirit gives me all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. So no matter what financial situation you have, no matter what marriage situation you have, no matter what children's situation you have, whatever situation you have in your life, the Lord says, I've already given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And you will find the answer to each of those things in knowing Jesus in spending time with Jesus, in getting in the word, in seeking him in prayer. And the more that you know Jesus, right? You hear his voice. He speaks to your heart. It was so um, interesting because I just felt like the Lord kind of gave me a, a tangible example of this. And, and you know, the Holy Spirit was described by Jesus as our helper. You ever need a helper in this life, right? I mean, I do. 
Uh, but I was dealing with an issue with my, my middle son. He's kind of just been struggling. He's not been doing great. And, you know, I just like, what, what is wrong with this kid? You know, and he's, he's my one who's very quiet. Like he will never just come out and tell you what's going on. You know, it's like, you got to like pull teeth. But then every once in a while, he'll just have like a full on meltdown. <laughs> you know, and then you'll find out about the six month worth of stuff that has been bothering him. You know, where my other kids are kind of like wear their heart on their sleeve. You always know what's going on with them. You know, so it's like, you got to deal with him a little bit differently. So he came home a couple weekends ago and we had this big heart to heart and it wasn't like a, a real like fruitful conversation. I was just kind of felt like it was just bouncing off. Like what I was saying, it was just like, yeah, but yeah, but like just excuses and this and that. And I, I was kind of discouraged after the whole thing, to be honest, because I was like really excited about him coming home. He, he's away at college in Arizona. And I thought, we're just going to have this like great talk, you know? And it really wasn't just, I mean, it wasn't a bad talk, but it just wasn't what I wanted it to be, you know? So anyways, he leaves, he goes back home. The very next day after that talk, I'm just reading in my one-year Bible, you know, which is already pre-laid out for me, right? Like I just turned to February 28th and I read what's there. So I'm reading my one-year Bible and it's this scripture in Proverbs. And basically it just it was the perfect scripture for exactly the conversation that he and I had had. And so I was able just to like put together a text message and I just sent him a text message like, hey, I just wanted to share this with you. This is in my daily Bible reading today. I feel like it pertained to that conversation you and I had yesterday and just was able to encourage him in the Lord and seeking the Lord for himself and whatever. And it was, it was super cool and it was super fruitful, but it was like, that was the Holy Spirit, right? Helping me because I left that conversation like, I don't know. I don't feel like that went good. I don't, I don't know what to do from there. But yet God brings this scripture to my mind. It's perfect for what I was talking with, exactly dealing with my son who has a certain personality and going through a certain thing just to help me. It's like, that was just such a clear example to be like, God has given you all things that you need for life and godliness. Had I chose to skip reading my Bible that day, right? I would have missed that nugget that the Lord had for him and I that I found in the word that day just by very practically reading my Bible and then God showing me by the power of his Holy Spirit like yeah this is something you need to share with me you know so it was just it was just a cool thing as as we realized that in knowing Jesus having this personal intimate firsthand knowledge of Jesus that we can we will find all things needed for life and godliness in Jesus it goes on to in verse number four by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So he says we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises. I love how he describes, like it's very descriptive to me how he says that, this, these exceedingly great and precious promises that we have in the word. And it says that through these promises, we have escaped the corruption of the world, right? And when you begin to think of even just some of the promises that just Jesus gave, right? Let alone what you find in the rest of the Bible, but just the, some of the things that Jesus gave us, right? He promised us eternal life, for all those who would believe in him. That is escaping the corruption of this world, right? That he has promised us eternal life. It's that, you know, that he promised to give us a helper, a comforter, the Holy Spirit. Amazing promise that he fulfilled to us, right? Giving us a helper to walk with us through this fallen world that we live in. He promised to give us life and that more abundantly when we find our life in him, right? That's an amazing promise that he's given us that in Jesus, you can have life and you can have it more abundantly. He gave us a promise that I am leaving, but I'm going to prepare a place for you in heaven. That's what he's doing right now, preparing a place for us in heaven, right? That's an amazing promise that yes, he left, but he left with a purpose that he's preparing a place in heaven for you. And then he gave us another promise. And if I went, I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring you to where I am, right? Such an amazing promise that he's given us there. He promised if you are weary and heavy laden that he will give you rest. A exceedingly great and precious promise because how often in this life do we need to find rest? And our rest is found in Jesus. And he promised us if you abide in me and I in you, your joy will remain, right? So he says, through relationship with me, if you choose to plug into a relationship with me, you will have joy in your life. That's an amazing promise. That's just a few that I thought of off the top of my head. But I think about all the promises that God has given us in his word, exceedingly great and precious 
promises that have been given to us. And Peter's reminding, remember, this is his kind of like last hoorah speech, right? Before he's going to die. And he wants to remind the believers of the many, many exceedingly great and precious promises that they have in Jesus. And I want to tell you, for you as a believer, this is one of the things where, you know, Chris often talks about that, how David strengthened himself in the Lord when he was discouraged. I want to tell you, if you are discouraged right now, this is one of the best ways that you can strengthen yourself in the Lord. Think about God's promises. Write down God's promises. Find his promises. This is where you got to be in the word, right? Because if I don't know what God's word says, it's really hard to hang on to promises I've never read or that I don't know right? But as I read these promises, you know, underline them in your Bible. If you, if you come across, you know, and you're reading something and it's just a promise that just God just jumps off the page of you, write it down, put it on a sticky note, slap it on your mirror. I mean, somewhere where you see it, where it's something that you'll be reminded of because it is one of the things that encourages us so much as believers when you're going through hard times and you're going through trials. And remember these people that Peter are writing to are going through immense persecution. They are being martyred for their faith, kicked out of their homes. Their homes are being burned. I mean, this is a crazy time to be a Christian. And one of the most important things that Peter wants to remind them is you have a plethora of exceedingly great and precious promises to hang on to that can get you through any situation that you're going through in your life right now. It goes on and it says in verse number five, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. So we are saved by grace through faith, right? That's very clear. The Bible makes that abundantly clear that we are saved by grace through faith, period. That there is absolutely nothing we can do to add to our salvation. When it comes to your faith, Here Peter says, add to your faith. So when it comes to your faith in Jesus, we are saved by faith. That's it. We cannot add anything to our salvation. But what is Peter saying here? He says, add to your faith. So he's saying, okay, now that you've accepted Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, what now? You know, what do we do at this point? Now we grow, right? That's, that should be the natural progression. That first I get saved. I put my faith in Jesus, which is a free gift. I cannot earn that. I did not deserve it, right? His grace is amazing. And he gave me this free gift of salvation. Once I am saved, right? Peter's telling us the now what is to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And as we, you know, for us to make this really, I don't care if you've been a Christian five minutes or if you've been a Christian for five years or for 50 years, the reality of it is that for all of us, no matter how long we've been a Christian, we should be making it our aim every day to be closer to Jesus today than we were yesterday. It should be the lifelong pursuit of the Christian to get more and more and more close to Jesus the longer we walk with him, right? But the reality of it is that it doesn't matter time in Christianity terms, doesn't determine maturity, right? It doesn't, you could have been a Christian for 10 years, but still be a baby, baby Christian because you've never added anything to your faith. You, you've never invested in adding these things that he mentions here to your faith. So you could have been saved for a long time, but really you have no depth. You're still a baby Christian and you don't have any roots and you don't know the promises. You don't know the word. You don't have a really super close relationship with the Lord. But then you have somebody who is like in, in terms of time, just got saved two months ago, but man, they spend every day pouring through the word of God and they're devouring as much of the Bible as they can. They're at church every time the doors are open and they are growing like crazy, right? They're maturing in the Lord. And so for us in our lives, this is something that is not going to just happen naturally as you walk with the Lord longer, right? We have to put effort into this. So if we want to grow in our knowledge of the Lord, it does require us to be adding things to our faith. Because normally when we think of, you know, like Christianity, we always think of subtraction, right? Well, I don't do this and I don't do that. And I no longer do X, Y, and Z. But here we're going to talk about addition tonight. Okay. So we're not talking about subtraction, all the junk that God has delivered us from in our lives, um, which he has done, right? I mean, that's a part of it. 
Um, but now we're going to talk about addition, godly addition, the things that he wants us to be adding as we desire to grow closer to him. And he says right here at the very beginning, but for this very reason, giving all diligence, right? So that giving all diligence, it means give attention to. Put this as your number one priority is another way that you could say that or strive after. So these are the things that Peter is saying for the believers that we need to be giving attention to. Putting as a very top number one priority in our life should be adding to our faith these things that he has mentioned here. And he says here, add to your faith. Um, and, and here's the other thing too that I, that I want to say when he, before we like kind of get into all the, the different words that he says to add, you know, as we desire to grow in the Lord and to develop a closer relationship and move forward in our walk with the Lord, the reality of it is that if you're not putting effort into that, if you're not putting effort into growing in the Lord in your life on a regular basis, the truth is you will start moving backwards. There's no static relationship with the Lord. It really doesn't work that way. You're either growing or you're, you're sliding back because there's really no way just to stay in the same spot. So for us, this is the thing. It's, we want to be growing in the Lord. So we're not backsliding into all those things that he delivered us from, right? Into all those things we did subtract out of our lives when we got saved. And in order to keep us from moving backwards, we have to be constantly moving forward and adding these things that he mentions here. And so when it, when it starts the list here, um, it, you know, he says here, um, being diligent, which is moving forward. Like I said, that we keep adding to our faith. And he already kind of told us this right in first Peter too. It, remember in first Peter, he said, like newborn babes desire the milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So he's our, he's like reiterating some of the same things too that he already talked about in first Peter, which is his desire for Christians to grow. Um, and because the truth is as um, somebody in ministry, one of the most heartbreaking things um, that you see in the ministry is you see people who get saved, their life radically changes, and then they, they don't ever grow right? They just, they have, they have had this experience, um, but they're not adding anything to that faith, you know, and they never choose to develop that relationship with the Lord. They're not in his word, church going sporadic, this and that. And it's not very long before you see that person, you know, train wrecked by life, you know, where they're back to, to drinking or they had an affair or now they're divorced and all this kind of stuff that happens because if they're not moving forward, they are naturally going to revert to those things that they were delivered from initially. And so, you know, for, for a ministry leader, that's heartbreaking, you know, because the, I mean, Jesus even talked about that, right? When this word of God, it's like the parable of the sower, right? When the word of God gets sown in, in the stony ground, it springs up immediately, but there's no root. And so when he comes, that plant never produces any fruit. It just dies immediately, you know? And so I think at, at, from a shepherd's heart, right? Peter told us to shepherd the flock of God. He He's basically begging people like he it, it breaks my heart it breaks his heart when you think about and we can all sit here and think about somebody who started well right who started walking with Jesus who God did deliver them in, in a miraculous way and now today they're not even walking with him anymore you know and you're like it just it, it just breaks your heart because you're just like they're wrapped up in a whole bunch of garbage again and their life has all this pain and suffering that's not necessary right and, and it does so for Peter you know I think part of it his like put all diligence into this, you know, and he's really encouraging the believers at the last of his life is because he doesn't want to see believers go backwards and get caught up in the world again and stop walking with Jesus. And so when it says here in this phrase, he says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Just in the verse before that, in verse four, he says, we have been partakers of the divine nature. Once you're saved, right, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We do have a new nature. We don't have that sin nature that we had before. Obviously, we still, you know, have sin that we deal with, but we are a brand new creation in Christ. We have a divine nature now. We are spiritual beings once we've been born again, right? And so here, this list that he's given us, these are the divine nature. You want to know what he's talking about there when he says divine nature? It's going to be this list of, of attributes that he lists here. And the first one is virtue. That word virtue there, 
It means moral excellence. It actually can imply a moral courage. And the reality of it is that in this day and age, does it take courage to live a moral life like the Bible lays out? You better believe it does. It's a very unpopular opinion, right? If you say you believe what the Bible says about marriage, about, you know, whatever, name a topic, you know, it's exactly what's right. It's considered wrong. What's wrong is considered right. And so for us, you know, this, but the Bible has called us to a moral courage, you know, that we as Christians being Christ-like live our lives according to God's word. And there are not exceptions to God's word, right? I mean, a lot of people want to say, yeah, well, that, that doesn't apply to me. You know, I can live with my boyfriend and, and God understands. Things like this, you know what I mean? Where we can make excuses. And the truth is that if you want to grow in the Lord, there is a moral excellence that has to be a part of your life. Where you choose to live your life in obedience to God's word. Because the truth is, sin will hinder your relationship with Jesus. Here's the deal. You do not hear well, right? When you're living in sin, your ears are all clogged up with a whole bunch of junk. And the reality of it is if I'm living in sin, I don't want to read the Bible because I know what the Bible says. I don't want to go to church because I know that pastor, he's probably going to talk right at me and say something, you know, about what I'm doing. And I'm not, I'm not going to go fellowship with Christians because they're going to know what I did Friday night or whatever the case may be. The reality is sin separates us from the Lord and it puts a wedge between me and him because when I'm not right with him then I am reluctant to go to him even though he is right like the father of the prodigal son right who was waiting and looking every day for his son to return and when his son finally did come to his senses and decide to get out of the pig pen his father ran to him and threw his arms around him that is our God right but when we're in sin, we don't want to go home, right? We know we stink. <laughs> we, we know we got the pig pen all over us. And so the reality of it is if you want to continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord, we have to be virtuous. We have to be morally excellent. It doesn't mean we're ever going to be perfect. We're all going to blow it. But also sin hardens your heart. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that if you continue to live in sin, it's like a hot iron being passed over your heart over and over and over again, where pretty soon I am not open to hear God. Pretty soon I won't hear his voice anymore because my heart has become so hard from my sin that I will not be available for the Holy Spirit to talk to me. I will not allow God to do a work in my heart because my heart has been hardened by sin and we never want that to be us. The next thing it mentions there in the list, it says knowledge. This is a different Greek word than what he used at the beginning. I remember I said at the beginning, it was this intimate firsthand knowledge. This knowledge is understanding. That's basically what it means, that we add understanding, which is important for a believer, right? That you understand what you believe, why you believe it, what the Bible says, those type of things. And then he's, the next thing it lists there is self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. We know that, right? When the list given to us there in Galatians chapter 5, self-control is mentioned. Um, this is one that I think, you know, for us as Christians, is it appropriate uh, to be flying off the handle, um, losing your temper all the time, saying whatever it is that comes to your mind, whenever it comes to your mind, is that appropriate? No, right? That's a lack of self-control. If when a situation happens and I respond in my flesh before allowing the Holy Spirit to get a hold of my heart, it's the flesh, right? And it's a lack of self-control. So if you see a Christian who is constantly flying off the handle and upset about everything and rude to people and all this kind of stuff, it really is a marker of immaturity. It's something that they haven't added to their faith, right? It's an area where we need to grow in. And if we're honest, we probably all need to grow in the area of self-control, right? I mean, have kids. It'll teach you that. You have very little self-control. <laughs> But the truth is, you know, as I was looking at the list, I thought, you know, this is something that some people just choose never to grow in because you can make a lot of excuses for your lack of self-control. I had, we had a situation a couple weeks ago and it was from somebody who uh, should be very spiritually mature. And it was just, the conversations were just not nice. And he kept hanging up and it was like this crazy kind of family situation. And you know, finally, I just said, listen, until like you can get yourself under the control of the Holy Spirit and we can talk rationally, we probably just need to stop talking, you know? And he didn't like that answer because he was like, you know, basically was like, 
you know, I am. And I said, well, they're afraid of your actions would speak otherwise, you know? And, and the reality of it is that if you're hurting people's feelings all the time and there's like a wake behind you of just broken relationships and all this kind of stuff, because we have this sharp tongue or we, we react in this way and we always are having problems with all of our family and we don't get along with anybody. Like it could be a clue to start looking at yourself. Like, is it a lack of self-control on my part? Because the reality of it is we all have those feelings that well up when situations like that. And we want to say all of these things, you know, even in our marriages, right? I mean, the truth is that self-control can exhibit itself in your marriage, in your relationship with your kids. It's like, rather than just like biting his head off, take a second, get yourself under the control of the Holy Spirit, ask God to help you respond in the spirit and not in your flesh. It's something that you and I, I don't think we'll ever get perfect, right? But it's something we need to be adding. We need to be working on this is adding self-control because a lack of self-control is essentially a lack of spiritual maturity. It says there, perseverance is the next one. Perseverance or that word means steadfastness, constancy, endurance. And the truth is that in this life, it does require endurance, okay, perseverance. And the reality is this, this word, when you think of perseverance, I love that, that definition of steadfastness and constancy. Um, because if your life is like a roller coaster and, or your relationship with Jesus is like a roller coaster where you're really, really close and then you're really not and you have all these like ups and downs and this and that, it's like that's, that's not God's best for you right? He wants your relationship with him to be steadfast, constant, no matter, because you know, people who, you know, when life is good, they're here, their hands are raised. And then when life is not good, why did God allow this? And they have this like great crash that happens at that point in time too. But the truth is what God wants for you is regardless of whether you're on the mountaintop or you're in the valley, that your relationship with him remains the same, that you have this like perseverance that endurance, that steadfastness, that is not, your relationship with Jesus is not based on where your circumstances are at this moment. Because sometimes life is good and sometimes life is not good. But your relationship with him, really he wants you to always stay in that same place where, and I'm not saying that you never go through emotions, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying there are a lot of Christians that live this very emotionally led life with Jesus. And their relationship with him is dependent on their circumstances at the moment or the emotions that they're going through. But here it's saying, listen, you have need of perseverance in your life. It's something you need to add to your walk where you make a decision, no matter what, no matter where, no matter when, I will follow Jesus. Regardless of what happens in my life, regardless of the fires or the storms or the trials that he allows in my life, I'm going to persevere and I'm going to keep growing in my relationship with him, no matter what, no matter where, no matter what happens. That's that perseverance that he's talking about here. And in Romans five, I just want to read to you a couple of different scriptures that kind of just reiterate that same idea. But in Romans chapter five, in verses three through five, it says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. That's the, there's like another list that the Bible gives us. This one, though written by Paul. So he is talking about the same kind of progression that Peter's talking about here. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. And so that same idea that you have need of perseverance and as you persevere as you choose to continue to grow in your relationship even in the hard times it says he's going to develop character in you he's going to develop this character and that character is going to produce hope and hope does not disappoint the reality of is god is faithful no matter what no matter what you're going to face in your life god is going to show himself faithful at the end and as we stay steadfast as we stay constant in our relationship with the Lord, you're going to come to the other side of that thing, you know, that's making you want to quit. And you're going to be able to look back and be like, yeah, you're right. This is what God produced in my life during that time. You know, this character that I developed, empathy or whatever the case may be that he's developing in you, that he could not have developed any other way and that he gave you a hope to get you through it and he got you through it. That's going to be the story that you're going to be able to tell when you persevere through those things. And in Hebrews 10, it says this, in Hebrews 10:36, for you have need of endurance 
so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And so that basically just says you have need of endurance and you're going to go through hard things. But the reality of it is that one day when you stand before God in glory, it's all going to be worth it. The Bible says that nothing that you face here on earth could be worthy to be compared with what awaits you in heaven. And so this reminder for us, don't move backwards. Keep moving forward, even keep persevering, even through those hard times. The next thing he mentions here is godliness. That's pretty self-explanatory. It's godlikeness. Um, and then the next I, uh, one is brotherly kindness. That word there is uh, Philadelphia is basically uh, phileo is the um, Greek for that, but it, it's translated in for us Philadelphia. It's a brotherly kind of love. Um, and the reality of it is that we could all use to grow in love all the time, right? We can never be loving enough. We can never um, uh, be kind enough to one another. And Peter has harped on this over and over and over through first Peter too. love one another love what he he even talked about like exerting yourself for love's sake for your brethren you know that it should be something that we are putting effort into um and and the reality of it is that the the more we know Jesus the more we walk with him he is going to naturally make us more like him right and, and that kindness that love that affection you know the bible also says it's a great witness for us as believers right the, by, the how will they know you're my disciples by your love one for another right this this affection that we have being kind to one another valuing one another not judging one another not criticizing other believers you know i mean all of us like if we're if we're really starting to think about love we all have some work to do here in our love for one another, in our brotherly love. But, you know, for us, encouraging one another, helping one another, those are all kind of ideas that are wrapped up in this brotherly kindness. And I mean, I think we have so many great examples as a church. You know, somebody has a baby, somebody gets sick, or whatever. Our church is so great to rally around and bring meals and do those type of things. That's all exhibiting brotherly love. You know, I think we have a super caring congregation. You know, it's like, I hear people all the time, you know, I know Melissa and Gary have been going through stuff and I hear people asking her like, how are you doing? What do you need? You know, this type of stuff. It's just, that's brotherly love, right? That's that care and affection that we have for one another. And we need to be putting effort into that. He's like, he said that, that diligence that we add to our faith, this brotherly kindness. And the last item he says there is love. That word love is agape. So that is that self-sacrificing God kind of love um, that is not conditional, right? This agape love is an unconditional kind of love. It's loving the unlovely, lovely, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, brotherly kindness can kind of be a reciprocal thing, right? You know, like you're kind to me, I'm kind to you, you know, that's kind of the idea of brotherly love. It's kind of a reciprocal kind of thing, but agape is totally different. Agape is an unreciprocal, it's just, it's the self-sacrificing, you know, somebody's super rude to you and you respond in love, you know, that type of thing, you know, where, where it's just a, a, a kind of, you know, um, well, I'll just read it to you. That's a better way than trying to put it into words. How about that? I'll read you the definition of that kind of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, um, rather than trying to come up with my own definition. It lays it out for us in 1 Corinthians 13. It says love, and this is all agape. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Agape love never fails. I like that. It goes on, it says in verse number eight, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for if these things are yours. So it's a choice, right? It's a choice that we can add these things to our life. But he says here, if these things are yours and abound in you, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful. That word barren there, it basically means to stop working. It'd be like a watch whose battery died, right? The watch that bat whose battery died doesn't really do you a whole lot of good, right? It's not working. It's not 
helping you, not getting you anywhere on time. That's what that word like barren means. It just means basically not helpful. Um, and, it, and, and you'll never be unhelpful and you'll never be unfruitful when you're constantly desiring to grow in your relationship with Jesus. When you're putting diligence into adding these godly virtues to your life that he's talking about here. And <clears throat> uh, it goes on, it says in verse number nine, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So he kind of gives you like the dichotomy there, right? If you're doing these things, you're never going to be barren and you're never going to be unfruitful, which for us, the, the point of the life of a believer is to bear fruit, right? Jesus said, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit, right? We're to be bearing fruit for Jesus. Um, while we're in this, you know, tent that we're in this temporary dwelling that we're in. So he says, if you have these things, you're going to be fruitful. But if you don't add these things for he who lacks these things is short sighted, even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. We don't want to be short sighted, right? We want to keep eternity in mind that here's the reality that we're not living for this life. We are living for the next. And so for us, while we're here to make it our aim to become more and more like Jesus by adding these things to our lives, the truth is that people who get distracted, because it does happen, right, where he just said at the beginning of this, put all diligence into this. Make this the number one priority in your life. Does everybody make growing in Jesus the number one priority in their life? Right? No, a lot of people don't. Because the reality is there's lots of things that vie for first place in my life. There's lots of other affections that can steal my heart away, right? Money, whatever. I mean, there's, there's a million things that I can put as the number one priority in my life. But here he's saying, listen, if you do that, if you put anything above your relationship with Jesus, you're being short-sighted because this life is but a vapor. We live for eternity, which is forever, right? And we are living for an eternity with Jesus in a place where there is no more crying, no more sadness, no more all of those things. But we are to live our lives in such a way where we're keeping that in mind and not getting sidetracked, getting short-sighted by a very temporary, say, happiness, I'll say, which happiness is based on your circumstances, right? You know, but so oftentimes we trade our eternal rewards, eternal blessings, you know, I mean, you think you're doing these things and you, and you lead someone to Christ, right? You bring them to church because you're the most loving person that they know at work because you've added that in your life. Like the reward that you get in heaven for that, can you even put a, a, a price on that, right? That somebody else is now in heaven for all of eternity because you chose to put him first in your relationship with him, right? As opposed to you put all your effort into whatever, making a lot of money and buying a nice house, like big deal. In 10 years from now, it's not going to be that nice of a house anymore, right? Things are going to be breaking down. So it's short-sighted, right? To put anything above Jesus. And in Colossians, it says in Colossians chapter three, it says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, Christ, who is our life, I love how he says that, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Christ should be our life. He should be our number one priority. And he says here, he even goes so far as, as say, if you're not putting diligence into adding these things to your life, you have forgotten that he cleansed you from your sins. So basically you're kind of taking advantage of the grace of God, right? You forget that God, what he did, you know, I mean, being in the Holy Land, it's, it's, our, our trip was amazing. But one of the things that it always does do is it makes the price that Jesus paid on the cross just so real. Like you're, we were there literally in the praetorium, the very stones that Jesus would have walked on are still there today where they would have beat Jesus unrecognizably. Like he bled on those very stones and you're underground and you're sitting in this place and the, the gravity of it all like really begins to hit you. What Jesus did for you, because we do, I think especially as we've been saved for a long time and you know, we've subtracted all these things in our lives and you know, we, we forget, you know, what all God delivered us from and what all he delivered us to, right? He delivered us from sin and death to life and eternal life in him. 
And so for us, you know, it's like to, to keep that in the forefront of our mind. It's also a way that we can be loving and, and all of these things because the reality of it is if you really looked at the world with that lens that these people, we live in a lost and dying world where all these people are, are, are just lost and they're lonely and they need Jesus in their life, you know, and, and what better fruit than bringing people to know Jesus. And if I'll add these things to my life, I'm going to naturally bear fruit in my life, right? Because I appreciate that I am not walking in darkness anymore, right? That I have been delivered from my sin, all of those things. So he's basically saying like the, the, the motivation, why do you want to do these things? It's not to earn your salvation, right? We've already dealt with that. You don't earn your salvation, but it is to make you fruitful. It is to, to have us walking in this constant realization of what Jesus did for us, the price that he paid for us. And the reality is that we want to bear fruit. We want to bring other people to come to know him as well. It goes on, it says in verse number 10, therefore brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. This is such an amazing promise that he gives us here. He says, if you do God math, right? And you add these things to your life, you keep a close intimate relationship with Jesus. You will never stumble. That is a promise people. <laughs> That's an amazing promise. It doesn't mean that we're never going to sin. Obviously we're not going to be perfect till we're with Jesus. But what it does mean, if you are adding these things to your life and making it your number one priority to be close to Jesus and to walk with him every day, you will never fall irrevertibly. You will never have that train wreck, sin, you know, altering experience in your life. Because the truth is, it's impossible, right? The Bible says if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. But yet you see it happen all the time where people's lives are train wrecked. Christians, people's lives, right? Who, who have an affair or whatever the case may be. And their kid, like, it's just this ugly divorce. It's this train wreck of a situation. And here Paul, Peter says, listen, if you don't want that to be you, you don't ever want to fall in that way where it just wrecks your whole life. Then you will add these things. You will put this as your number one priority because the fact of the matter is you can hang on to this promise. If you add these things to your life, you make this a goal of your life to grow in Jesus. You will never stumble because the reality is he's going to keep you right close to him, a right heart with him. We're, we're dealing with sin in our lives. All of those things keep us moving forward. It goes on. It says in verse number 11, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so here he's reminding them, keep your eye on the prize, right? He says, you know, listen, eternal, he says the everlasting kingdom. I like that, you know, kind of terminology that Peter uses here of the everlasting kingdom, because we are just passing through here. We do want to bear fruit while we're here and bring as many souls with us. And for us, you know, as we choose to add these things to our lives and grow in our relationship with Jesus, it's going to keep us in that right relationship. We're going to naturally bear fruit in our lives. We are going to experience joy in our lives and fulfillment when we're doing the things that he's asked us to do, right? When we're, when we're adding these things to our faith. And so I have some homework for you guys tonight. Um, so I want you guys to really take a minute and I want you to think this week, you know, kind of meditate on this, think about it, pray about it. Are you farther along in your relationship with Jesus today than you ever have been in your past? You know, are you closer to Jesus today than you ever have been? And then that's kind of the first question because that kind of shows us where we're at, right? Are, are we moving forward or are we sliding back, you know? And so for each one of us, we have to do a real accounting in our own lives. We know that. We know whether we're closer with Jesus now than we were a year ago or five years ago. The, the second thing is that I want you guys to do is I want you guys to, to like re-go through this list that we talked about. And I want you to really kind of take an accounting in your own life. You know, what in this list is God speaking to your heart that you need to add to your life? You know, when you read this list, we all kind of know like, yeah, this is a problem for me. You know, <laughs> like I, I need, I need some more self-control. Like I don't have great perseverance or whatever the case may be I, for yourself. You know, as you pray through this list, read through this list, take an accounting of yourself where you need to add 
a little bit more of this in your life and then pray and seek the Lord and ask him to help you add those things to your walk with the Lord and make it a part of your daily prayer as you begin to ask the Lord to, to, you know, develop these things in our lives that will make us fruitful for him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, we thank you that your word is so powerful, Lord, and, and your word does surgery in our lives. And Lord, I thank you for this encouraging chapter from Peter, Lord, just encouraging us to put you first in all that we do. And it's very easy in this world that we live in to get sidetracked and um, Lord, to get distracted by other things. But Lord, I just pray um, that as we all really do take some time this week to do an accounting of where we're at and are we moving forward? Are we continually adding these things to our lives, Lord, that, that will make us fruitful. Lord, I, I pray that you would make us fruitful. I pray that there would be amazing fruit in our lives as we're able to share with our friends and our family and our coworkers about the amazing price that you paid on a cross to redeem us, Lord, that we would, um, Lord, be able to share the, the amazing grace that you extend to us. And Lord, we just thank you so much for tonight and just pray that you bless these ladies as they go about their week in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.